Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Shout out to the MVPs this week who have showed up and showed out in the Apple podcast reviews, sending me tons of love. I always appreciate it. And with such a hard subject to cover, I really appreciate the uplifting words. So if you have a minute today, be sure to rate the show wherever you listen. Before I begin, I want to point out a hilarious Margot flub from the Tall Hot Blonde episode. I was talking about Jesse's mom at some point, and I made a reference to a song. (laughs) And I said something like, Jesse's mom has got it going on. Well, oops, it's not Jesse's mom. It's Stacy, Stacy's mom. That's the song I was talking about. But I know you got the picture. Only one person called me out on it, so I appreciate it. I thought it was a funny flub, but a flub nonetheless. Love you. Okay, moving on. (laughs) So I have been promising more coverage of lesser known serial killers, and I'm really delivering starting with this episode. And well, this case was recommended by someone who personally knew this serial killer, someone who had him over her house, someone who let him hold her three-month-old baby, Unbeknownst to her, he had the murder of three innocent victims under his belt. All the while, he hid behind a warm smile and easygoing personality. Major trigger warning for the next couple episodes. Today's episode includes rape, the murder of children, and vile computer searches. It also includes the description of an abduction. While I do not go into excruciating detail at all, I do believe it is best if you skip this episode if you feel you may become distressed. With that said, join me today as I tell you about a serial killer living among us at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. Now, let's dig in. My sources for this episode include various appellate court opinions and court filings, reportings in The Washingtonian, The Daily Herald, Chicago Tribune, New Zealand Herald, the Department of Justice website, Arlington Now, Chronicle Illinois, Washington Times, and websites Find a Grave and the Bureau of Prisons website. Something weird was going on in February of 2010 in the Arlington, Virginia area. In the late hours of February 4th, 2010, into the early morning hours of February 5th, an Arlington police officer named Corporal T.L. Clifford saw something that he deemed suspicious. Officer Clifford had been working the, I'm quoting here, Valley Beat for eight years now. So he was familiar with all the regulars. Whenever something out of the ordinary popped up, he'd notice. Officer Clifford saw a silver Dodge Durango that seemed out of place, and it was driving slowly along Sherlington Road. Officer Clifford had previously owned the exact same vehicle, even fitted with the exact same black off-road grille on the front of his Durango. In addition to this vehicle driving suspiciously slow, it piqued his interest. But eventually, the Durango left the area. But about an hour later, the Durango popped up again on Officer Clifford's radar. He kept thinking, what is up with this car? What is this guy doing? This time, the Durango was slow rolling near Four Mile Run, which is a stretch of path where you will usually find runners or bikers. And having lived myself near this area, Virginia has a lot of early risers who get on these trails to go on their morning run before their morning commutes. And all this shady driving was happening early on Friday morning. Well, Officer Clifford saw as the Durango parked his car between two trucks near a bike path and the driver shut off his lights and sat in his car idling for about 15 minutes. And then the Durango left. Officer Clifford's spidey senses went off. And while the car didn't do anything illegal, The officer ran the plates and didn't see any warrants or anything suspicious on that account. So instead, he wrote the license plate number down, never realizing 
that his quick thinking would lead to the takedown of a serial rapist and a serial killer. Because unbeknownst to Officer Clifford, the person in the driver's seat of that Durango was scouting out areas for his next victims. Well, wouldn't you know it, the next day, February 5th into February 6th, Officer Clifford spotted the Durango again. On this day, the streets were extra quiet because there had been a massive snowstorm dubbed Snowmageddon that pretty much incapacitated the city, which if you have ever lived in the D.C. metro area during a snowstorm, woof, these people straight shut down everything at the potential for snow. So I can totally envision this in my head, especially if it snowed a lot. This time, when Officer Clifford saw the Durango, he followed it and he watched it as it parked near a poorly lit spot near some bars. The Durango parked, turned off its lights and sat there idling. Then it took off. But Officer Clifford didn't just want to let this person go. He wanted to call one of his cop buddies who was up ahead. Officer Clifford called Officer Andrew Nuselli, who went by Nuke, and was like, dude, watch out for this silver Durango. It's the second night I've seen it just creeping around, people watching. As police work goes, you might be watching out for something one minute, but then something else pops off. So it's off to the next thing. And that's what happened here. Officer Clifford and Nuselli were called to a traffic accident. But while there, who slow rolled by with its windows down? But the silver Durango. This time, as reported by the Washingtonian, for the first time, Officer Clifford and Officer Nuselli got a good look at the driver. It was a clean-shaven young man with a black wool cap. In the early morning hours of February 10th, 2010, a 25-year-old woman was walking to her boyfriend's house in Arlington, Virginia. I am going to call her Maria, and that is a pseudonym. That's not her real name. Maria had worked the night shift as a nurse at the ER. A storm had hit that night, so she got off early from work. She took the metro to Virginia Square Station and then intended to take a cab, but due to the storm, there were none available. So she hoofed it. While she was walking near the 1700 block of North Quincy Street, a man approached Maria from behind and grabbed her jacket. Maria instinctively went to turn around when the man displayed a handgun and told her to stay quiet and just walk. Maria told the man, hey, just take my bag. But the man kept pushing Maria in the direction of his SUV. Maria resisted the entire way and then the man brandished a knife. But Maria refused to get in his car. She was like, I am not going in there. And she was able to break free from his grasp, dropped her purse and ran as fast as she could to her boyfriend's house. At the house, Maria immediately called the police. By the time the police arrived, the man, his SUV and Maria's purse vanished. Maria gave police a detailed description of the man's face. And while she saw the man's SUV, she really couldn't remember many details. She thought it was, I don't know, light colored, maybe tan. And so with that information, police put out a bolo, a be on the lookout for a tan SUV. Guess who heard that bolo? Officer Clifford. Officer Clifford heard that and was like, wait. So he immediately told a different officer about seeing a shady looking silver SUV a few days earlier. But this other cop was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he kind of just brushed it off. So instead of coming forward with the information, Officer Clifford didn't pursue it further for now. But then two weeks later, more women would be attacked by a man driving a light colored SUV. On Saturday, February 27th, 2010, at about two o'clock in the morning, a woman who I will call Helen, that's also a pseudonym, was walking up to her house near North Wakefield Street when a man approached her from behind. He told her he had a gun and for her to get in his car, specifically his SUV. Helen refused and a struggle ensued. The man then brandished a stun gun and put it on Helen's neck. Miraculously, though, either the gun didn't go off or Helen was freaking Wonder Woman and it didn't affect her because our girl Helen was able to run away and call 911. But the man had gotten away. And while any smart person would lay low for a while, This man was desperate and he struck again two hours later on the same street. (music) 
Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office. Sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. This episode was made possible in part by Honey Love. The reviews are in and Honey Love came out on top for best wedding day shapewear. With wedding season upon us, this is the shapewear you've been waiting for. Whether you're a bride, a guest, or just looking for an everyday good fit, Honey Love is your go-to for all things shapewear. I know, I know. When you hear the word shapewear, you probably get an image in your head of not being able to breathe. But that's simply not the case when choosing Honey Love. Their best-selling item is the Super Power Short. And let me tell you, they are glorious. I recently fit into a red dress that I haven't been able to fit into in a long time. But when I put it on, I felt like something was missing. I slipped on my Honey Love Superpower shorts and voila, it held me in in all the right places and sculpted me in areas that needed a little help. And while wearing that red dress, I felt confident and simply blessed. And that's because the Superpower short is created with Honey Love's Signature X, which targets and sculpts your midsection without squeezing your natural curves because it's designed to work with your body, not against your body. And the bonus is that Honey Love made it simple to use the bathroom while wearing this piece. I know it's made with 100% cotton gusset, so you can skip the extra undies and use their convenient opening, which makes it super easy for bathroom use. But comfort doesn't stop at shapewear at Honey Love. They also make comfortable bras, tanks, and leggings. This season, treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com when you use my code MILITARYMAMA. That's 20% off at honeylove.com when you use my code MILITARYMAMA. So it's now 4 o'clock in the morning and two 23-year-old grad students who I'm going to call Kesha and Jill were walking home from a night out with friends. They were heading towards North Wakefield Street. As the women were stopped in front of Kesha's house, according to reporting in The Washingtonian, Kesha stopped to find her keys in her purse when all of a sudden a man emerged from behind a parked car. He showed the ladies that he was carrying a gun. He then demanded their wallets. The women were terrified. They were like, we don't have any money. But the man likely knew the cops might be patrolling the area from the first attack two hours earlier. So he quickly forced the women inside of Kesha's house. He asked her if there was anyone there, and she said no, but her roommate was upstairs sleeping. Inside the house, he ordered Kesha and Jill to kneel by the couch. He then patted them down and bound their hands with the cord from a vacuum cleaner. Then he left the room. While the man was out of the room, the women were able to loosen their hands, but the man soon returned with a kitchen knife. Upset, he retied Jill's hands with the cord from an iron and he tied Kesha's hands with the cord from a vacuum cleaner. He then ordered both women into a bedroom. The women obliged, not sure what the hell was going on. Inside the room, the man ordered both women onto the bed. But Jill, the smaller of the two women, was like, hell no. The two women were so confused. The man who was doing all of this, he looked like a high school kid at best. 
and he looked really unprepared and unsure of himself. He even taped Kesha's mouth with painter's tape. Now, you know the kind. It's usually blue and doesn't really stick well. Not surprisingly, the tape kept falling off. In the back of their minds, the women probably thought that they could take this man on. But he had a gun and a knife. Well, again, after asking the ladies if they had duct tape, the man left the room and the women jumped into action. Kesha threw herself at the door, slamming it shut. Then Jill grabbed her phone that was still in her pocket. Yes, because the intruder, he had patted her down, but he completely missed the cell phone. So Jill dialed 911. Then she dropped the phone into the laundry basket. It's unclear to me if she did this on purpose or by accident. But as soon as the man returned to the room, he grabbed the phone, threw it against the wall. Then he kidnapped Jill, forcing her out of the house, dragging her down the street and forcing her into the back seat of his SUV against her will. Then he took off. Kesha hopped to the front door where she was able to get a good look at what was happening. She saw the SUV and she started screaming and slamming the vacuum cleaner around until her upstairs roommate woke up and came downstairs and they called 911. Although Kesha was in rare form with adrenaline rushing at full speed, she gave police as much information as possible. And remember, authorities were already looking for this guy because he had attacked a girl just a few hours earlier. By now, it was 4.25 in the morning and officers mobilized, forming a command center nearby and putting out an APB, an all points bulletin for Jill and the SUV. Kesha told authorities that the assailant was, quote, so young he could have passed for a high schooler, end quote. Everyone in Arlington was now looking for the man, the SUV, but most importantly, they were looking for Jill. Meanwhile, the man drove Jill away from the scene, all the while pressing her down into the back seat so as to not bring any attention to himself. Then, once he was in a desolate area, he parked the car and went into the back seat with Jill where he forced her to perform oral sex on him. Then he put a condom on saying, I'm not stupid. And then he raped Jill. He continued with the assault. And when he was done, he wrapped her head and mouth with packing tape and placed her on the floorboard of the back seat. Then he drove towards Prince William County in Virginia, where he stopped in a wooded area near the highway. The man then assaulted Jill all over again. Then he removed the scarf that she was wearing. He replaced it around her neck and tightened. As the man prepared to do this, Jill yelled out, what are you doing? And the man responded, what do you think I'm doing? And then he squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Once Jill's body was lifeless, the man disposed of Jill's body in the woods and then drove off completely satisfied that he had gotten his hands on a victim that didn't get away. A while later, at around 8 o'clock in the morning, Thomas and Lynn Love were driving along the Prince William Forest Park near Alps Road when they spotted a young lady slowly crawling and then standing in the snow. The young lady looked like she was in pretty bad shape with blood coming from her head. The lady was Jill. She had survived. Thankfully, the couple stopped and helped Jill, wrapping her in a blanket, turning up the heat and driving her as quickly as possible to the nearest hospital. Jill was shivering and she was turning blue by the time that she was rescued. Reports indicate that Jill had scrapes on the tops of her feet from when the man dragged her out of the house and into his car. When police arrived, Jill told her harrowing story. She told them that the assailant was driving a silver SUV. And with that, they put out a bolo. All the while, officers were in Kesha's neighborhood asking neighbors if they saw anything. There were helicopters searching from above, canines conducting ground searches. It was nuts. And of course, the bolo went straight to the cops. And who do you think heard it? Officer Nuselli heard it first. And he calls up Clifford and he's like, hey, remember when you ran that tag? And so they're able to track that tag down. When they run the plate number, the car is registered to a young man named Jorge Avila Torres. I'm going to call him George for the rest of this episode, though. They pull up his license plate and boom, it's the same guy who was driving the SUV that they spotted people watching at weird hours during the night. Nuselli and Clifford jump into action, providing this information to the cops working the robberies and the abduction. They bring one of the survivors in and show her a picture lineup. And she undeniably chooses George's picture 100% certain that was the man. 
And with that, they issued an arrest warrant for George's arrest. George Avila Torres was born on August 18, 1988. He grew up in Zion, Illinois. According to reporting in The Washingtonian, George's parents emigrated to the United States from Mexico. His father worked in a cardboard factory and his mom was a homemaker. George had one sister, Sarah, and they were particularly close. In high school, George cut class often, instead getting into what appeared to be some low-level trouble. In 2005, however, George got himself into some big trouble when he was caught with marijuana, which caused him to get expelled. But that wouldn't stop him from graduating from Zion Benton Township High School. And after George graduated in 2006, he beelined his butt to the Marine Corps. By April of 2009, George was stationed at Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Arlington, Virginia, where he was doing admin work. He lived on base in Keith Hall. Keith Hall was known to house mixed personnel, including male and female Marines, sailors, and a handful of airmen. Friends reported that George was a pretty dependable guy who loved cars, trucks, and video games. He was the type of Marine that would give you the shirt off his back. So what was this other side of George? And could he really have been involved in all of these attacks on women and the attempted murder of Jill? Well, on February 27th, after the cops had pieced this puzzle together in super lightning speed due to the quick thinking of officers Clifford and Nuselli, authorities went over to Henderson Hall to investigate. Before they even got George, they found his Durango in the parking lot and they took a little peek from the outside and what they saw was chilling. Inside of the back seat, they found the iron exactly as the women had described. It was the iron that the man had used to tie Jill's hands. For some reason, they didn't want to stir anything up. So instead, they watched George's room and car. And it was less than a dozen or so hours after he left Jill for dead that George came strolling out of his barracks room and towards his car. But he wouldn't get far because he was immediately apprehended. When brought in for questioning, George was his usual talkative self. Authorities described that he was even cordial. He acted real dumb the entire time, very innocent. The interview lasted a good two hours, but the conversation was circular and went nowhere. George never admitted to anything. A few days later, they tried to talk to him again, but George wasn't talking. But in the meantime, authorities were searching George's things. They searched his barracks room, his car, his computer, the whole nine yards. The car, which is where George conducted his business out of, well, that had the most telling evidence tying him squarely to the crime. They found the iron, the stun gun, the packing tape, and they even found Jill's college ID card and an earring that fell out when she was in the back seat. They also found blood in the back seat, which would later prove to be Jill's. Inside George's room, they found a loaded 10 millimeter semi-automatic lock and ammo. They discovered that George bought this gun on February 5th, hours after the first time that Officer Clifford spotted him and wrote down his license plate number. Investigators also found a pair of Nike sneakers and the clothes they believed that George had been wearing when he attacked Maria, Jill, and Kesha. The shirt had blood on it that later proved to belong to Jill. A search of George's computer was a treasure trove of evidence that proved that George was into violent acts of rape. Court records revealed that from April of 2009 through February of 2010, George had saved dozens of pictures and videos depicting violent sexual activity with titles such as, quote, all rape videos, quote, best forced sex, quote, forced sex scenes, quote, rape collection, and quote, sleep assault movies, end quote. George had also previously viewed a website with instructions on how to make chloroform. The evidence against George was overwhelming. And to add it all up, the rape kit conducted on Jill also directly tied George to that crime. And with that, George was charged for all three attacks that took place on February 24th, 2010 on North Wakefield. He was facing 14 total charges, including use of a firearm, abduction with intent to defile, robbery, armed breaking and entering, rape and forcible sodomy. According to court records, while he awaited his trial, 
George was held at the Arlington County Detection Facility. Now, George's case is very interesting because DNA is not usually put into a national database until after a person is convicted. But according to reporting in the New Zealand Herald, Virginia was the first to authorize taking DNA from a defendant before they were convicted. Which, bravo, think what you think, but I am a strong proponent of this. Think of all the unsolved cases that would potentially be solved if this were the case everywhere. By June of 2010, once authorities put George's DNA into the database, I will be darned, authorities got a mother flipping hit. And not just any hit, a hit for the double murder of two little girls five years earlier. The victims were Laura Hobbs and Crystal Tobias. HBO Max presents Love and Death. It is human nature to take risks. Would you be interested in having an affair? Starring Elizabeth Olsen and Jesse Plemons. You need to be careful. Betty Gore was murdered by someone she knew. The new Max original limited series, Love and Death, now streaming on HBO Max. And the truth has a way of coming out. Listen to the official Love and Death podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Laura Gail Hobbs was born on September 25th, 1996 in Wichita Falls. She was born to her mom, Sheila, and her father, Jerry. In 2005, little Sheila was in the second grade at Beulah Park Elementary School. Little Laura absolutely loved reading, and she really enjoyed acting out the stories that she read with puppets. Whenever Laura wasn't into reading, she was outside enjoying the fresh air, riding her bicycle, and hanging out with one of her best friends, Crystal Tobias, who was also her neighbor. Crystal Tobias was born on October 26, 1995, in Waikiki, I'm not sure if I said that right, Illinois. Crystal had an older brother named Alberto. Crystal loved to play dress up, she loved to play outside with Laura. And they were inseparable and she loved picking dandelions. Well, on Mother's Day 2005, May 8th, eight-year-old Laura and her bestie, nine-year-old Crystal, told their parents they were riding down to the park. Both little ladies climbed onto Laura's bike and pedaled as fast as they could out of sight. The girls loved playing outside and this was not out of the ordinary for them. But what was out of the ordinary was for the girls to not be home for supper. So when dinner time came and went, and the girls had not returned home, their families immediately called 911. A massive search for the girls ensued. By the following morning, May 9th, authorities had not found the girls. Of course, as a parent, you're always out there searching for your kid. And Laura's father, 34-year-old Jerry, together with Laura's grandfather, were searching for Laura and Crystal. And they were walking on a bike path in a wooded area of Beulah Park Nature Area, which was very close to Laura's house. When down by the ravine, they spotted Laura's bike. They immediately ran down to inspect. And when they went to investigate, they made a gruesome discovery. The girls were dead, laying side by side. They had been beaten and stabbed. And it is said that one of the little girls was also sexually assaulted. I can imagine that happening upon this scene is gut-wrenching. But Laura was discovered by her father and her grandfather. Autopsies would later reveal that their killer was ruthless. He stabbed Laura 11 times and Crystal 20 times. Laura was the only child who was raped and whoever perpetrated this crime left semen behind at the crime scene. When authorities began to investigate the brutal double homicide, a witness came forward and said they remembered seeing the young girls riding bikes with a local 16-year-old boy named George Avila Torres. So authorities followed up with George. George happened to know Laura because George was good friends with her older brother. And in fact, George considered Laura like a little sister. When they questioned him, George alleged he didn't know anything about the double murder. And because he was so young and probably looked very innocent, authorities cleared George as a suspect. And well, authorities had already zeroed their sights in on their probable suspect, Laura's 34-year-old father, Jerry. You see, Jerry had quite the rap sheet. The Associated Press reported that Jerry was, at the time of his daughter's murder, a convicted felon. His crimes stretched back all the way to the 1990s in Texas, where he had arrests for assault and resisting arrest. Then, in 2001, he got arrested in Texas after he chased one of his neighbors with a chainsaw. 
For that crime, he was jailed for two years and had just been released from a Texas prison on April 12, 2005. After he was released from a Texas prison, Jerry went to Illinois to move back in with Sheila and his daughter, Laura. But he hadn't been out of jail but for three weeks when his daughter and her best friend were murdered. So clearly, he was suspect numero uno in the eyes of investigators. As soon as Jerry discovered the bodies, he was brought in for questioning. And for the following 24 hours, he underwent intense scrutiny about the double homicide. And by the end of the interrogation, Jerry confessed to the double homicide and he signed a police typed statement about what he did. The story of a convicted felon murdering his daughter and little friend ignited the passions of the community and the prosecutor would be seeking the death penalty. After getting much needed sleep and recovering from the discovery of his own daughter and friend laying brutally murdered by a ravine, Jerry Hobbs, well, he recanted his admission, but it was too late. With a suspect now in custody, authorities sent the semen found at the crime scene off for analysis. And when the results come back three years later in 2008, the DA is shocked. The DNA from the crime scene is not a match to Jerry Hobbs. But the DA refused to release Jerry Hobbs, claiming that the fact that the semen belonged to someone else didn't exclude Jerry Hobbs as a participant in the crime. And with that, Jerry Hobbs remained in jail for five years, five years pending a death penalty trial. It should be noted that five years sounds like a ridiculously long time to be awaiting trial. But according to my sources, the delay was due primarily to various motions and continuances filed by Jerry's public defender. And thankfully, while no one should wait in jail for that long, in this case, the delay will work in Jerry Hobbs's favor. But more on this in a little bit. Now, let's jump forward to 2010 again, when George's DNA is entered into the national database and hits as a match to the DNA found at the double murder of Laura and Crystal. Authorities see this and they are stumped because remember, the man they believe to have committed the murder had been in jail for five long years. Well, authorities discover that George had actually been questioned in connection to the girls. In fact, he was the very last person anyone ever saw with the two little girls. What else was there? Well, they dig up that in 2005, 16-year-old George tied up a female friend, but she was able to break loose and flee. They also learn about the marijuana and the expulsion from high school. And they learn that George didn't skip a beat. As soon as he graduated high school, he enlisted in the Marines. Now, while this is common for many who joined the military, authorities begin to wonder if George left in such a hurry to avoid any more questioning in the double homicide. And guess what? If that was his motive, it worked. On June 27th, investigators brought George in for questioning regarding Laura and Crystal's murder. And George played the whole, I don't know what you're talking about game. And they were like, dude, your DNA was at the crime scene. Do you know that it's like a one in 985 quadrillion chances that it's your DNA? But it doesn't matter what George said because they had his ass dead to rights. Summer of 2010 was a busy summer for George because while he waited in jail, he was sitting in his cell just stewing over the fact that the walls to the shitty house he built were crumbling on top of him. And so he orchestrated a plan to have the Arlington, Virginia victims murdered. Say what now? Bro, you need to calm way down right now. But he wouldn't. Our boy George was serious about wanting those ladies dead. Once he found the guy who would do the deed, he even drew him a map of the victim's house. So I don't know if the would-be assassin was an informant or what, but authorities got wind of the assassination scheme. They put an informant by the name of Osama El Atari, who I will refer to only as Osama from now on. Anyway, Osama was a restauranteur jailed on several charges that he scammed several banks out of $53 million. And according to the Daily Herald, this cat would do just about anything to get a reduced sentence. 
even wear a wire in prison. And that he did. In August of 2010, Osama got close to George, chatting him up, and eventually, George confessed to killing little Laura and Crystal. All of the conversations caught clear as day on audio. George went into excruciating detail about what he did, which matched up perfectly with the girl's autopsy. All except for he did not admit to raping the little girl. Because, you know, that might be a death sentence for him in prison, meaning with the other prisoners. George not only talked about what he did, but he talked about what happened when he saw that Laura's father, Jerry Hobbs, was getting all the heat for the murders. He thought, quote, damn, I'm clean. I'm good. I ain't got shit to worry about, end quote. And on May 12th, 2012, George Avila Torres was charged in Illinois with the murders of Crystal Tobias and Laura Hobbs. When asked why he did it by Osama, George always changed up his answers. He'd say it was just random or no reason. And one time he even said he had to take them out because they saw him delivering drugs. Osama asked George if he ever felt any remorse, to which George responded, quote, does a lion feel remorse when it kills a hyena, end quote? Osama was shocked and he was like, you don't feel bad at all? George responded, quote, no, end quote. Okay, y'all, somebody seriously come over here, hold my earrings while I quick sneak into whatever jail cell this guy is in and I take him out my damn self because what? But wait, Mr. Talks Too Much had something else to tell Osama. The girls in Illinois, they weren't his last victims. He had actually killed a girl in the barracks. The girl lived seven doors down from him, and NCIS wasn't even looking for her killer. Damn, this is a two-part episode. If you're interested in listening to part two right now, you can do so by joining the Patreon or you can subscribe to the premium subscription on Apple Podcasts. Other than that, part two will be out in two weeks. I want to give a quick shout out to Haley Gray for her assist with researching this episode. I'm happy to be able to get even more assistance with these episodes as life is about to get that much more hectic with the school year kicking off for my two oldest kiddos. Again, this podcast would not be possible without all of you, my listeners. So thank you so much. Make sure that you follow me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on TikTok at Military Margot with a T at the end. This episode was researched and written in collaboration with Haley Gray. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and is produced in collaboration with my boot camp and hire fan club members. This month's newest associate producers are Justin, Chance, and Aaron. This month's newest assistant producers are Nadia, Sparky, Janelle, Hazy, Kimberly, Caitlin, Jasmine, Daisy, and Steve. The music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you the conclusion of this military murder story next time. I was working on her podcast. I don't want to.